Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much for the uh, for the invitation and uh, to you and the other organizing for putting on such um, fun two days. I've learned uh, a tremendous uh, amount. Um, as said, I, I will talk about the so-called genes eye view of evolution, and this will uh, highlight some of the, the themes of the book that I published with the same name. Um, that actually uh, came out uh, exactly one year um, ago. Um, now, the genes eye view of evolution is a way of thinking that has been simultaneously influential, but also uh, contentious for the past half uh, century. Um, it's a way of thinking that was first uh, introduced by the, the American George Williams uh, in a book called Adaptation and Natural Selection, published in 1966. Uh, I think this is a hugely uh, important book, probably one of the most important books of the second half of the 20th uh, century in, in, in evolutionary theory. Uh, and here he does many things, but one of those is that he for the first time kind of clearly articulates what we now know as a gene side view of evolution. However, this was a book uh, that was primarily aimed at uh, uh, fellow biologists, at, uh, at an academic audience, uh, which is why I think most of us are introduced to uh, these kinds of arguments uh, uh, through another book, The Selfish Gene, written by Richard Dawkins, published 10 years later, where many of the same ideas are presented, but are done so in a more, even more lucid, in many ways, much more confrontational way. Um, and to see why uh, this way of thinking can be contentious, you know, think of what Darwin did uh, originally in its kind of the original formulation of his theory. Uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection is one about organisms. It is individuals that live and die. It's individuals that vary in how well they are at, uh, attracting mates, how well they are uh, at reproducing. And this is kind of the, the unit of explanation in the original formulation. The genes I view, however, kind of takes um, seriously the, the fact that it's only genes, according to the argument, that is faithfully transmitted from one generation to the next. And therefore, the argument goes, that's what should be the central unit of, of explanation. So in this way of thinking, organisms are nothing but this kind of transient entities present in one generation and gone in the next. And the true stars of the show are genes who are kind of thought of as competing with each other for representation in, the, in future generations. Um, now, the genes I view uh, at this point in time occupies a rather peculiar position in uh, biology. Uh, it is not a kind of straightforward uh, empirical hypothesis that can be rejected or verified by a clever experiment. Um, though it can certainly help us develop good uh, experiments. It's also not a general mathematical framework, um, though it can help us develop formal versions of specific arguments. Uh, rather, it's something more like a way of uh, thinking. Uh, Bill Hamilton, when reviewing The Selfish Gene, described it as a new way to read uh, nature. Similarly, Dawkins would describe it a few years later as a particular way of looking at animals and plants and a particular way of wondering why they do the things they do. And depending on who you ask, this either represents kind of a foundational insight about the, the mechanisms of evolution and, and natural selection, or kind of a deeply flawed misunderstanding of the very same processes. These two attitudes are well represented by two giants of uh, 20th century evolutionary theory, Bill Hamilton uh, and Dick Lewinton, who uh, disagreed vehemently about this and also did so in print. Um, and they, they both reviewed uh, the selfish gene. Hamilton reviewed it for science, where he said that not only does the selfish gene represent an excellent description of the current state of evolutionary theory, it also a book that is written in such a way that it can and should be read uh, by everyone. In contrast, writing for, for Nature, uh, Lewinton described as a caricature of, of Darwinism, uh, describing the thesis advanced in the book as Panglossian, um, something, a kind of way of deriding a form of evolutionary biology that would become more famous a couple of years later in the Spandulus of San Marco paper that he published with, with Stephen Jay Gould. Now, um, 
whatever merit there may be in Lewington's uh, argument, the tone of his review was such that Hamilton wrote to the editor of Nature to, to, to protest, where he described uh, Lewington's review as a disgrace and comparing his uh, behavior in this debate uh, to that of uh, Bishop Wilberforce, who, who famously debated Thomas Henry Huxley at the British Association in Oxford over, the, over, over Darwin's theory. This exchange ended then with Lewton also writing to the editor of Nature, pretty much telling uh, Hamilton to calm down, saying that Hamilton thinks he's Darwin and that Dawkins is his Huxley. Um, and in many ways, this would come to set the tone for the debate over the genes I view for the, the next half century. And in many ways, that is what this book is about, trying to understand um, why people continue to, to disagree over the value of it um, and why it kind of continues to attract such strong uh, emotions. Um, and it does so by focusing on four central questions. And that is, uh, when it comes to the genius view, what is it? Uh, where did it come from? What was the, the intellectual milieu from which it uh, emerged? How did it develop? How did it respond to the criticism that it received? Um, a lot of it uh, fair, and um, some of it uh, not so much. Uh, and then the book tries to uh, end by trying to put the, the genius of view in, in, in the context of contemporary evolutionary theory. And if there's a red thread running through, through the book, it is that the, the genius of view, I, I would argue, is a tremendously powerful um, thinking tool, especially when you want to work out the logic of natural selection. And as we shall see, especially situations where the logic doesn't really make sense from the perspective of individual organisms. However, and this is the, the important part, just like with all tools, to get the most out of it, you must understand what, what problem it was designed to solve. Just like you can use a screwdriver for, for, uh, as a hammer, it is much better when you try to, to, to nail nails uh, to the wall. Um, so what I thought I'd do uh, today is that I'm going to highlight what I think is kind of like the, the kind of historical context from which the, the genes I view uh, uh, emerges and highlight some of the kind of key people uh, involved in that, and then kind of see kind of where this way of thinking has been uh, especially uh, helpful. Um, and in the book, I, I lay out this argument that I think you can kind of summarize the, the intellectual core uh, of the genes I view uh, by uh, highlighting three people. That is William Paley, uh, Ronald Fisher, uh, and Bill Hamilton. And between them, they kind of represent these three strands that, that the genes I view uh, synthesizes. The first is a commitment to, to adaptationism, a commitment to the idea that adaptation or organismal design is the central problem that a theory of evolution must be uh, able to explain. So it's a very clear idea what the key problem is. It also has a key, a key argument for what the way of solving that problem is. And that is, this is where kind of the Fisherian version of population uh, genetics comes in. Um, and then kind of in many ways, the most kind of the proximate uh, causes uh, involved in it is this time in, in the history of our field where there's a kind of general rejection of uh, kind of naive or lazy forms of, of group selection. And here, uh, the work of Hamilton plays an especially important part. Uh, and I thought I'd kind of walk through these three uh, components uh, one by one to kind of highlight uh, what I mean. So in many ways, I think the uh, Paley may seem like a, a strange choice given his, his profession as a uh, kind of, as, as, a, as a vicar and, and professional apologetic, uh, apologetic writer. Um, but in one thing that the genes I view inherited from this general tendency within natural uh, theology, the idea that you can make inferences about the divine world by studying the natural world, was this kind of uh, commitment or fascination with organismal uh, design. And this kind of went quite naturally from natural the theologians who studied this to, to, to study the divine to evolutionary biology studies in kind of the context of, of natural um, selection. And in general, many historians of biology and as well as kind of practitioners of the field have, have highlighted that it seems to be that this kind of tradition taking this to be the key problem has been particularly uh, prominent in, in, in British uh, biology. Uh, and partly you can kind of make this point by highlighting the popularity of Paley. Um, so one way you can do this, I thought you can kind of give quotes from kind of three generations of, of, of British biologists. 
Um, Darwin, of course, who was initially convinced by the argument of Paley, but he wrote that, I don't think I've ever admired a book more than Paley's uh, natural uh, theology. I could have almost formally have said it uh, by heart. Now, subsequent generations of, of biologists did not, weren't as taken by it in that way, but did not uh, shy away from using it for more rhetorical purposes. For example, Domina Smith in, in, in 1969 wrote that the main task of any theory of evolution is to explain uh, complexity. That is to explain the same set of facts which the 18th century theologian Paley used as an evidence of a creator. Uh, and finally then Dawkins, of course, who built a whole book, probably one of his absolute best books, The, the Blind Watchmaker, around Paley's uh, uh, appeal to the watchmaker analogy, uh, wrote that Paley had a proper reverence for the complexity uh, of the living world, and he saw that it demands a very special kind of explanation. And in, in a later talk, a couple of years later, he would describe himself as a neo-Paleist obsessed uh, with the illusion of, of purpose. So I think you can, you can kind of make this quite nice argument about this. this there is this tradition in, in British biology, which the genes have you very much uh, is part of. And um, this kind of story also involves a good caveat though, especially for the, those of us uh, not trained in, in, in history in any proper kind of way, is that it is to be seduced by these nice kind of patterns. Kind of the main caveat to this is of course George Williams, who uh, is American, does not fit this quite you know, nice story of the English public school, Oxbridge kind of, of, of person. He comes from a much more humbler background in, 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 in America, but still had this fascination with Paley. So if you look in adaptation of natural selection, he, he, he includes uh, references to, to Paley's argument. And one, of, and his, one of his very last books, simply titled Natural Selection, he includes as the appendix excerpts from Paley's book, uh, Natural uh, theology. Um, but I think the kind of the, the picture that this paints is that it's a way of thinking that is committed to uh, adaptation as a central problem uh, of the field. Um, now, the second leg um, of uh, the making up the core of, of the genes I view, I would say is Fisherian population genetics. And I say Fisherian population genetics because you can say that a genes I view argument is implicit in, in most uh, population genetics, whether it's the, the kind of Haldane or, or right or, or kind of any other uh, successes, but it's kind of more explicit in, in, in Fisher. And here, uh, his 1918 paper on the correlation between relatives on the supposition of medial inheritance is especially important. Now, this is a paper that's famous for many reasons. It's introduced a concept of variance and, and so on. But for our purposes here, what makes it special is that Fisher in this paper introduced what is a quite a subtle but quite radical shift and what, what he means by uh, environment. And it kind of is a concept of the environment that only really makes sense from, from a gene side view. And that is when he's interested in calculating the effect of uh, substituting one allele for, for, for another. So going from being homozygous for one allele to heterozygous to homozygous uh, for the other allele. What is that uh, effect on the phenotype? He wants to keep the rest of the environment constant. So you can also, so you can isolate the effect of that substitution. Uh, and he uses then a concept of environment that includes um, the rest of the genome. So kind of from an allele's point of view, it includes all the other genes in the genome, as well as all the other alleles segregating in the population. And again, this is kind of a way um, that only really makes sense if, to include as part of the environment if you're thinking in terms of, of, of genes. This runs through a lot of George Williams uh, writings. Uh, I've just highlighted a quote here from the foreword to the 30th anniversary of the selfish gene, where Dawkins writes that each gene is pursuing his own self-interested agenda against the background of the other genes uh, in the gene pool, the set of candidates in the sexual shuffling within species. Those other genes are part of the environment in which each survives in the same way as the weather, predators and prey, supporting vegetation and soil bacteria are part of the environment. So I think Fisher stands above the rest uh, when it comes to the origin of the genes I view. And in many ways, the kind of more technical disagreements of uh, the genes I view that's played out in the kind of biological literature, uh, in many ways can be traced back to disagreements between Fisher and Wright, and I deal with this in, in, in the book, but it's, I also have a specific paper in, 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 in evolution that kind of uh, highlights the kind of Fisherian and the Wrightian ways of, of looking at this. And uh, finally then, uh, both books, the Adaptation of Natural Selection and the Selfish Gene, emerges at a time and contributes 
to a general rejection of group selection. Uh, the subtitle of Williams' book is a critique of some current evolutionary thought, and he largely focused on this kind of naive form for the good of the species uh, group selection. Similarly, the kind of what's been known as the four heroes of the selfish gene are, in addition to George Williams, John Maynard Smith, uh, Robert Trivers, and Bill Hampton, all of whom had introduced kind of alternative ways of explaining social behavior that were kind of centric, individual centric, did not rely on appeals for group uh, benefits. And a particular importance here is Hamza's work on inclusive fitness. And kind of, um, to the best of my knowledge, the very first time, if you want to trace back when selfish genes is used, or the idea that genes should be selfish in this kind of sense of the word, it is in the lecture notes that Dawkins typed up when he was a graduate student in the 1960s, when his advice in Nico Timbergen was away on sabbatical, and he was tasked with lecturing to, to undergraduates on Hamilton's idea. So in those type notes, to the best of my knowledge, is the first time uh, selfish genes is used in, in this kind of way. But we've seen between them this kind of commitment to adaptationism, for sharing population genetics, and the rejection of group selection paints this picture, I think, that kind of approaches um, evolution in a particular way that can be summarized with this kind of question that when we say that adaptation is for the good of something, what is that something? Highlights the importance of adaptation, but also that the way to answer the question of adaptation is to explain what is good for, who benefits. So the genes I view then makes this move to say that it can't be the group or the species or even the individual organism. The organism is too temporary. It's a unique combination of genotype, environment, and its interaction. It's here in one generation, it's gone in the next. Only genes had the longevity required to be the beneficiary uh, of, of natural selection. Um, and as kind of, um, as Costa showed in, in his very, I think, uh, enlightening talk, what we mean by gene varies a lot historically, and between different parts of the field. Um, the genes I view use a gene in a very loose way in many ways. Both of them simply define it as since whatever part of a chromosome that segregates and recombines with appreciable frequency or any portion of chromosomal material that potentially lasts long enough to serve as a unit of natural selection. So it's kind of completely agnostic in many ways of where one gene starts and one ends, um, but it uses this kind of agnosticism about it and in many ways would prefer not to talk about the material basis at all to kind of trade that, to kind of use that agnosticism to trade it in, 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 in other uh, questions. And that's why it, it kind of, it's been this kind of general claim from the gene side view that evolution by natural selection requires two entities, replicators, which is a generalized term for the, the unit of inheritance, and then something to play the part of vehicles, something where these replicators are bundled together and is the part that actually interacts with the, the natural world. And before I finish, I, I'll just kind of highlight where this kind of way of approaching things have really paid off. Uh, so it kind of, the genes have you initially earned its stripes by making sense of old problems in the field. And a lot of them were related to social behavior, things like um, altruism in, in new social insects. Here is an example of an army ant, a queen surrounded by her workers. And this is kind of a classic problem that doesn't really make sense from, from an individual point of view. Why would an individual ever evolve to be sterile? Um, but with Hamilton's notion of inclusive fitness and the kind of gene side view interpretation of that highlights that from a, a gene side view, it does not matter if you're transmitted through the body in which you happen to reside or a copy of you uh, is transmitted through another individual that you can kind of somehow have a causal influence on. But the gene side view would not have had the influence that it's had if it only made sense of old problems. It also helped us uh, realize or recognize new problems. Um, and no one really made this point better than, than John Maynard Smith. This is from an essay that he wrote for the New Scientist uh, magazine in, in 1985. And he was commissioned to write it to uh, commemorate the 10 year anniversary of, of uh, Ed Wilson's uh, social biology. Uh, and in this essay, Maynard Smith kind of discusses the influence of, of, of Wilson's book, uh, but he also lays out the case uh, for uh, a genic view uh, of the world. And he highlights that, that, yes, this helped us make sense of these kind of old problems of uh, eusocial insects and other forms of, of altruism in nature. But it also points out that uh, conflict cooperation is not just something that happens between organisms, but it also happens inside of them. And he ends this essay with a question of how did it come about that most genes, most of the time, play fair, such that a, a gene success depends only on the success of the individual uh, that carries it. Uh, because what biologists at 
uh, at that time had began to realize, and we now know with full force, as, as, as Tom so, so, so nicely uh, laid out, is that there are many ways um, for genes to play unfair. We usually refer to them these days as selfish genetic elements, that they are genes that have this some way of promoting their own transmission at the expense of other genes in the genome, and occasionally even uh, on or organismal fitness. And again, it's kind of as Tom's nicely laid out, this is a really truly weird and wonderful world. Each example is slightly more bizarre uh, than the next. Uh, but again, this is something that can be quite hard to make sense of from if you kind of focus only on individual organisms, uh, but kind of comes quite naturally uh, when you take a gene side view uh, of the world. Um, now, of course, this is not all there is to biology to, to understand social evolution. There's many problems where a gene, gene side view may not be the best uh, way of thinking. And again, this kind of goes back to the kind of central point of the book and what I hope of, of this talk is that the gene side view is a really great tool to take on the world. But like with all tools, you must understand what it was designed uh, to solve. Um, um, with that, I, I want to highlight a, a large number of people who were very kind uh, to me when, when I was writing uh, this book. Um, that does not, that's not to say that they all uh, agreed with me. Sometimes they were just kind enough to explain uh, how and why uh, I was wrong. Um, but, uh, and that, again, I'm so thankful to be part of this uh, lovely uh, symposium. And with that, I'm happy to take uh, questions.